Can you hear me? Good morning, second service. How are we doing this morning? Good to see you all this morning. Mike brought up an interesting point, and I often talk with Hanosis about it, the young adults. I'm part of that ministry as a servant. And I always say, get out of yourself and into others and invest. And that's exactly what Mike said, and it's so true. But this morning, I want to start out with a little bit of audience participation. Are you guys good with that? Okay. So I want you to repeat after me. I got a passage that I'd like to start out with this morning. morning. Are you ready? Are you ready? I can do do all all things things through Christ Christ who strengthens me. me. One more time. I can do all things things through Christ Christ who strengthens me. me. And one last time, I can do all things Through Christ, Christ. who strengthens me. me. And I really want you guys to grab hold and hold tightly to that passage because we're going to need it as we get into our study this morning. Remember, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you in whatever it is in your life that you're struggling with. If you give it to God, you can get rid of it. So control. Very big word. It's something we all have a disposition to. We can consider its allure more valuable than gold and more sought after than diamonds. Why? Because it has power. Do you have any power in your life this morning? Do you have any control over your life today? Can you say you have control over your finances this morning? How much control do we have over our attitudes? Do we have a problem consuming alcohol? Maybe we have an issue with drug abuse. How much control do you have over your temper and your anger? Do we have control over how much we eat? Do you have a problem controlling lustful thoughts or sexual immorality? What about control over your time? Does God have the time he should have in your life? Does your family have the time that they deserve or do other things take its place? Do you manage your time well and is it balanced? I think it's obvious to us all here that we all struggle in areas of our life where the flesh has control or power over us. So this morning, I want to talk to you about a dirty little four-letter word. I want you to take your right hands, place it on your chest. It's called self. And when married together with the word control, you could say that we produced an oxymoron. Because if we're honest, in our flesh and in our minds, those two words almost seem incompatible. They disagree with one another. They're incongruous elementally. They don't get along. So what does self-control look like? Well, one definition for a particular word states this. The exclusive regard for one's own interest or happiness, a self-love or self-interest which leads its possessor to purposely ignore the interest, happiness, and privileges of others. So that's not the definition for self-control, is it? If you were paying attention, you might have thought that that was an odd statement. Well, that's because it is. I just described to you a word called selfishness. So let's read it again. The exclusive regard for one's own interest or happiness. A self-love or self-interest which leads its possessor to purposely ignore the interest, happiness, and privileges of others. Doesn't sound like self-control, does it? So if we were to bring self-control down to its rudimentary level, we could define it as thinking before speaking or acting. But oftentimes as Christians, we can all attest to this, that it's one of the most difficult Christian graces to attain. Self-control. 
Why? Because it's in complete conflict with our flesh. See, we seek our own inclination and our own pleasure and comfort before others, don't we? It's like we are walking civil wars, warring within our our soul, spirit against flesh. That's who we are. We have a sin nature. So if you're here this morning and you're thinking to yourself, do I have an area in my life where I lack self-control? I'll go ahead and spell it out for you big, plain, and straight. Yes, you do. Yes, I do. Yes, we all do. Amen. It's obvious. So a few questions to ask ourselves as we continue in the study this morning. Number one, how do we exhibit self-control? What does it look like in our lives? Why is self-control and self-discipline, if you have a King James Version, it's temperance, or temper, self-control, why is it important? And how does it affect our lives and those who are around us? Again, we just define self-control as speaking or acting before thinking. Have anyone in here ever acted or spoke about something before thinking about it and then regretted it later? (laughs) I see a hand raised over there. There's an honest man. So a few notable men made some statements about self-control, and in my mind, very profound. So I'd like to read what they said here. So those of you who may know who Edmund Hillary is, maybe you don't, but he was the first man who conquered Mount Everest. And he was interviewed about his passion for climbing. And his response to the interviewer was this, it's not the mountain that we conquer, but ourselves. Peter the Great of Russia is quoted as saying, I have been able to conquer an empire, but I have not been able to conquer myself. Hugo Grotius, the Dutch jurist and scholar, a teenage prodigy at the time, said, A man cannot govern a nation if he cannot govern a city. He cannot govern a city if he cannot govern himself. And he cannot govern himself unless his passions are subject to reason. And most notably and finally, King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, has a proverb in chapter 28, verse 25, it says this, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. So walls around an ancient city were pretty important, weren't they? They were designed to keep the enemy out. There were also judges that were put in place at the gates to determine who was allowed in and who was not allowed in. And furthermore, there are soldiers at the gates to enforce these decisions. And likewise, we should be thinking about controls we can put in our life to keep things that we don't want in out. So what's the point of all this? The point is we're never going to experience God's best for our lives if we don't have self-discipline and self-control. So how do we know if we have an area in which we lack self-control? A couple things to look for here. Whatever you think you need, can you live without it for a week? Tough question. If you find yourself becoming someone else when you don't have that thing you think you need, it might be a sign you have a problem with it. So we're going to look at a biblical example from a Bible hero we all know and love who lacks self-control in a certain situation and see if we can learn from their example. So if you have your Bibles today, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 5 is our text this morning. We are talking about King David. We've been going through 2 Samuel and Hanosis. So it's a good topic since it's fresh in my mind. So when you've gotten to 2 Samuel, say amen or look up here. And we'll get started. I heard one amen. 2 Samuel chapter 11, there's another one. Verse 1, we're starting. Verse 1, it happened in the spring of the year. At the time when kings go out to battle, 
that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. So David is sending Joab and the army. Joab is the commander of David's army. And he sends all Israel with him. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. David did not go with them. So in breaking down that, in David's day, wars were not normally fought during the wintertime. Rain and cold weather really uh, made it hard to travel and hard to campaign. So fighting usually resumed in the springtime. And kings would go out with their armies and fight. This was just something that they did. And David should have been there leading his army, but he was not. He remained in Jerusalem. And there's definitely a comparison in our life where we should be doing something and we're not, and we find ourselves in a predicament, right? Find ourselves caught up by some problem of life. So I'd like to give you a couple examples of how this could apply to our lives, but before we get there, let's go ahead and continue reading in 2 Samuel verses 2 and 3. Chapter 11. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold or look at. So David sent and inquired about the woman, and someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of of Uriah the Hittite. Now it's interesting there when you read that passage, then it happened. We'll get back to that in just a second. So let's think about David's mindset here. The scripture suggests that he couldn't sleep. He was probably uneasy and worried because he was not where he was supposed to be with his army. And he knew he wasn't where God wanted him to be. So I don't believe that when he saw Bathsheba, that it just happened. The enemy knows our weakness, and he will find an opportunity to let things happen in our life, right? And he'll try to get us outside of the will of God, and God wants the best for our lives. Satan wants to destroy us. You see, David had a problem with lust. A man after God's own heart, you might find that hard to believe, but it's true. He was not following God's plan for marriage. And we see this in the scripture. In 1 Samuel 25, 42, and 43. And in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. We have evidence of this. What happened? Well, David was multiplying wives. And David's practice of adding wives showed a lack of self-control. He was given into his flesh. Even though that was a practice that was normal back in those days, it was never God's plan or purpose for men to multiply wives. It was just something they did. How do I know this, you might ask yourself. Well, God said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, He said this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Man and wife is in the singular form there. And they shall become one flesh. Furthermore, Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 19, verse 5. And God again said this through the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5, 31. So what's the point here? Well, the point is, from the Old Covenant to the New, the Old Testament to the New Testament, God's stance on marriage remains the same. And David definitely knew this. And God has a place for us to enjoy these things. It's in marriage, right? But with one wife, not with many. Because when you look at it, sex is something God created. And it's very pleasurable, but it is not sinful when it's done within inside the covenant of marriage. Remember, God created this. The world changes this to be something it shouldn't be. So we have to restrain ourselves from indulging in that passion outside of God's plan. And fellas, remember this. You cannot lust for your wife because in marriage it's considered holy. It's not sinful. And what God allows can never be sinful. 
That's why it's called holy matrimony. Amen. Amen. The word holy means this, exalted or deserving of complete devotion. Matrimony can be defined as joining together or to be bound together. Another word we often use and see and hear is wedlock. Wedlock. So we enter into a covenant with God and our spouse. So you might be saying to yourself, well, maybe we don't struggle with lust like David did. But we all struggle in some areas of our lives, don't we? So before we continue on and finish our text in 2 Samuel chapter 11, I sort of want to scratch the surface on five of the most common things that we can all struggle with. And just because your struggle is not on this list doesn't mean that it's not a problem. And the solutions still remain the same for our issues. So a couple examples of lack of self-control, excuse me, Number one, gossip or gossiping. The Hebrew word translated for gossip is one who reveals secrets. So what does that look like to us, gossip? Well, usually it's a person who has privileged information about an individual. They go and tell others that information that they shouldn't be telling others about. That's gossip, right? Why do we gossip about other people? Well, number one, gossipers often have the goal of building themselves up and making others look bad. That's that's the complete opposite of how we should be living our lives. Look at the position of Christ taking the lower seat, serving others. The world would say, serve yourself and put down others. Number two, people who gossip almost always talk about a person's fault or faults without their approval or without their knowledge. It's almost a guarantee. And thirdly, it's normally embarrassing information or shameful details regarding the person's life. And even if they don't mean any harm, it's still gossip. I have a few passages here, if you just hold your spot in Second Samuel. In Proverbs, and it's interesting because Proverbs is considered the book of wisdom. So let's share some wisdom here about this topic. Proverbs 16, 29. A perverse person stirs up conflict, and a gossip separates close friends. Proverbs 18, 7 and 8 says this. The mouth of fools are their ruin. They trap themselves with their lips... Rumors are dainty morsels that sink deep down into our hearts. And thirdly, Proverbs 21, 23 says this, Whoever keeps his mouth and tongue, control over it, keeps himself out of trouble. Amen. So I have a quote that's very valuable to read from Jerry Bridges, and I thought it's fitting for this topic. And it says this, Our minds are mental greenhouses where unlawful thoughts, once planted, are nurtured and watered before being transplanted into the real world of unlawful actions. These actions are savored in the mind long before they are enjoyed in reality. The thought life, then, is the first line of defense in our battle for self-control. Moving on to number two. America's problem, debt or overspending. Any of us ever find ourselves having a lack of self-control in that area? Pretty common. Now, I'm not saying that all debt is bad or that you should never borrow money. Don't misunderstand me. But what I am saying is that we must be wise about the money that God has given us to manage. And debt can often be a facade with the title of prosperity when in reality it's poverty. So the idea here is not to get caught chasing wealth with money that you don't really have. A few points on this topic. We can own our stuff, or our stuff can own us, right? But I want you to pay close attention to this next point because it's very important. Remember the example that you are setting for your children. They are watching and studying your behaviors And they're learning how to live life through our lives. 
couple of scriptures here. Proverbs again. 22.7, the rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Proverbs 13.22 says this, a good man leaves behind an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. So there's a couple of different points we can get into there. But the idea here is that wealth is not a bad thing. Many great people in the Bible had great wealth. But again, the premise is that they owned their stuff. Their stuff did not own them. Number three, how about having a critical spirit? Anyone here have a critical spirit? I know I can sometimes. How can you tell if somebody has a critical spirit? Well, one thing is someone who is always complaining about things. Or a person who is very judgmental towards everything. Critical spirit. Or someone who senses or points out failure in others more than in themselves. We have uh, some verses about that in Matthew chapter 7. If you read through the splinter in the eye and the log, it, it really talks about that. So people, it's interesting, that have a critical spirit are usually pretty good at presenting their point, aren't they? They may even make valid points, but the problem really is with the manner and method behind how it's presented. Is it done in love or is it not done in love? Luke chapter 6, verse 45, Jesus is speaking and says this, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So obviously critical spirits are very destructive. They tear down both the recipient and the giver of criticism, especially when the motive is incorrect. But don't mistake this. The Bible doesn't disregard the benefits of construction, uh, con constructive criticism. Excuse me. Had a little bit of a mouthful there. So I had a question for you guys. Is constructive criticism or is correcting people wrong? No, it is not wrong. It's not. So how do we do it if we know it's not wrong? Well, ask yourself a few questions. Number one, what's the motive behind why you're doing it? Number two, is this correction going to be beneficial or should it be something we just forget about? And number three, is it done lovingly? Why do these things matter, you might be asking yourself. A few reasons. Oftentimes, we let our personal feelings and our emotions, the emotions of our heart, get in the way, right? The Bible tells us to walk in the Spirit, and we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Galatians 5.16 but remember, it also says in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can understand it? Who can tell? Who can discern it? So the heart is definitely something we need to be careful of. How do you know that it's right? When you do it, correction, constructive criticism. Well, you have to pray about it for one. You have to consider the notions of Galatians 5, 13 through 15, and I'll read it for you. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. We take pretty good care of ourselves, don't we? Verse 15 tells us, If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. The idea is treat others as you would like to be treated. Number four, alcohol abuse. And I can stand here in all honesty and tell you guys, I had a serious problem with this years ago. 
See, I'm not a guy who can have one or two or three. It was more like 12, 18, or 20. And I was not the person I was supposed to be to my wife. She can attest to that here today. But thankfully, God delivers. God delivers. So is this an area in your life that you have self-control over? Or do you struggle? Is it sinful to drink alcohol? No, it is not. But indulgence in alcohol, just like any other detrimental addiction, can take control of your life and destroy it. So how do people fall victim to an addiction? It's a good question. It's not in every case by any means, but many times we get into an addiction to mask something that has happened to us in the past. So what do people do when they do that? Well, they self-medicate to cope because it feels good. It's like a temporary escape from reality. It changes our fixation on life, but it's only temporary. It's still there. It's like putting a Band-Aid over an infection. And when it goes untreated, it gets worse. But sadly, in the Christian community, we can be very judgmental of people struggling with this, can't we? Whether it's drugs or alcohol. The reason why is because these types of addictions are in full display for us all to see, right? It's not hard to see a man falling over drunk or to see somebody high on drugs. It's the outward appearance of these things. You can see them. And we can find ourselves sort of grading sin and comparing our lives to other people, right? But we're struggling just the same in some way. And some of us who may be struggling with something hidden or internal could be things like envy. Have you all struggled with envy? Have you ever been jealous of something someone has or can do? How about selfish ambition, not worrying about who you step on to get to that next promotion or level of the job? Is it done in love? Or are you cutthroat? How about this one, covetousness? Have you ever wanted something someone else had and wished that you can take it from them? I think we can all say yes. Even Paul said this was an issue he struggled with. But the Bible doesn't make any distinction or grade any sin like we do if you really read it. Sin is what it is. And we must look at it as God looks at it. And the right response to view people is as God sees them. And a scripture that I often go to when I think about this is in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And it says in verse 8, For it is by grace you have been saved. What is grace? Grace is something given to you that you don't deserve. Reading it again, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, our resources, our efforts, our sweat. Not by our works. Why? So that no man can boast about it. It takes everything off of ourselves and puts it on the finished work of Christ on the cross. You can't earn your way. God has already done it. It would be to slap God in the face if we think we could earn our salvation on our own because it would say that Christ died in vain. So we got to love people where they are. Pray for them regardless of their struggle. The important word there is love. And how does the world look at the word love? The secular worldview says this, and it's much different than the biblical worldview. It says that love equates to tolerance. Do what you want whenever you want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody. That's what the world would say. But that statement, that uh, ideology is completely wrong. It's bunk. It's bonus. It's dead wrong. Why do I say that? Because if you do what you want whenever you want according to your own selfish desires, somebody will always get hurt. It's a fact, Jack. Galatians 5, 19 through 23 gives us a secular worldview of things. 
because it's following our sin nature, right? And in verse 19 it says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. There's sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, there's one, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living the sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, before our heart jumps out of our chest in fear, just remember that if we've done these things, it, it, it's not that we won't inherit the kingdom of God. What he's talking about here is those who choose to turn their back on God to continue in this lifestyle without repentance. But there's good news here. Verse 22 tells us the biblical view of how we should be living our lives. And we all know this, and I love reading this. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What a, a much different contrast in, in comparison, right, from the first set of verses to the second set of verses. Now, we don't excuse these lifestyles or behaviors, do we? We know they're destructive. It would actually be unloving and intolerant to watch someone we love destroy themselves and do nothing about it. So I have a, another verse here in James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. And it says this, My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. Amen. Amen. Number five, I know this one well, many of us do. Men mainly, but women too. Controlling your temper or anger. Do we have an issue with that here today? There was a little boy trying to sell a worn out lawnmower. A preacher walked up and the boy tried to persuade him to buy the mower. The preacher pulled on the rope several times to make sure the mower would start, but nothing happened. Not even a spit or a sputter. The boy told the preacher that he would have to kick the mower while saying a few cuss words before the mower could start. The preacher replied, son, I can't do that. It's been a lot of years since I've said a cuss word. The little boy replied, just keep pulling that rope and it will come back to you. <laughs> you see, the Bible has a whole lot to say about anger and our temper. It's mentioned more than 500 times. So it's pretty serious. And Ephesians 4.26 tells us that we can become angry, but do not sin. After all, isn't anger a God-given emotion? So how can we become angry and not sin? Well, it depends on the circumstance surrounding why we become angry and how we choose to deal with it, right? The great Chuck Swindoll, who most of us here probably know, said something interesting. He said this, life is 10% what happens to you, in 90% of how you react to it. Amen. Amen. Let's say that again. Life is 10% what happens to you in 90% of how you react to it. There's a lot going on in your mind. It's how we react to it. We tend to get things backwards, right? Because we react. We don't think. We don't use self-control. Have any of you here ever met somebody with a short fuse? Somebody with a temper problem? How do you feel when you're around them or when they walk into the room that you're in? Does things change? Yes. And handling our anger or temper is a very important life skill. In fact, Christian counselors report that 50% of people who come in for counseling have problems dealing with anger. 
So here's a few things that you can expect, expect living with unchecked anger in your life. I would almost guarantee that some of these things are going to happen. You can shatter communication with others and tear apart relationships if you have unchecked anger in your life. It can ruin your joy and peace of mind. It can cause bitterness and resentment. You can have feelings of contempt and disdain toward other people. It can cause the practices of manipulative and malicious behaviors. And in severe cases, it can cause fury and rage, even to the point of acting out in violence. In first service, I said this. It's not in my notes here. But have you ever looked at a product that you can consume or abuse or use that gives warnings on the label saying, can cause? I look at this and I'm saying, yes, it can cause these things too when it comes to anger. But sadly, many people tend to justify their anger in the outcome of their actions, don't they? Instead of taking responsibility for it. Right? We're selfish. We don't exude self-control. We don't want to take responsibility for our actions. We see it all over the news. We're living in a selfish time. Responsibility is a word that we don't know very well. So let me ask you a question. Is anger always sinful? No, it's not. Is it ever justifiable becoming angry? Yes, it is. Remember, anger is a God-given emotion, and it's natural for us to become angry at an injustice, isn't it? And we can know for sure that our anger is righteous when it's directed toward what God gets angry about himself. You might have heard the term righteous indignation. A couple of examples here that are pretty heavy. Child abuse or molestation. Things we can become angry about. That is justifiable anger because it's dead wrong, right? How about rape? Very heavy thing to talk about. Definitely. How about when people are treated harshly, verbally, and physically without a just cause? Can we become angry about these things when we see that? How about malicious acts of violence against humanity, war crimes? Can you become angry when you think about what happened in the Holocaust? Sure. And on a smaller scale, maybe somebody's betrayed your trust. Does that make you angry? Or maybe somebody's taken advantage of you. Maybe somebody's used you. Can that cause anger to be in our spirit? Maybe somebody's taken something from you or your family, something that you hold dear, and they just took it from you. It can cause anger. Or perhaps you were spoken to in a cruel manner or somebody made fun of you. All these things can cause us to become angry. These are all examples of that. And it's justifiable because we've been hurt or wronged. It's natural for us to feel this way. But our response to these things are much more important than the initial thoughts, right? James chapter 1, 19 and 20 says this. Most of you probably know this, this group of passages here. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. But please don't misunderstand me here. I'm not just saying that we should lay down on the ground and be walked on or become a punching bag. That's not what I'm saying at all. There are times when we must fight to protect those that we love and those that we hold Amen. dear to us. So I want to give an example of a situation like this, which God forbid this ever happens, but let's say we had an active shooter situation here in the church. Somebody came through the doors and started shooting people. That would not be a time to reflect on our thoughts and pray for the person shooting people, would it? No, that would require immediate action right now. Myself and most of you here would most definitely react immediately, so I don't have any... I have plenty of confidence in that, but you get the point I'm trying to make. There is a difference. 
And there are plenty of examples in the Bible when Israel had to fight to protect themselves from others. In fact, even today, if you pay attention to, to the current events in the Middle East, you'll find that there are plenty of nations surrounding Israel that would want nothing more than to destroy the nation of Israel. Some people are just unreachable. In fact, one of Iran's presidents stated this in describing Israel. He said, they are a disgraceful blot that should be wiped off the face of the earth. And he later said, anybody who recognizes the state of Israel will burn in the fire of the Islamic nation's fury. This doesn't sound like a reachable person, and I guarantee you, diplomacy is not in his vocabulary. So we must use discernment before we make a judgment. We must ask for wisdom and the word tells us, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. So we ask God for wisdom and discernment on how to deal with things. And remember, what is self-control? We've defined it as thinking before speaking or acting on something. And Paul sums it up pretty well, I believe, on this topic in Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. And it says this, I'm reading from the NLT in this version. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. So get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behaviors. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ forgave you. Quote from Daniel Webster to end this point here. He said this, I thought this was very important. Educate your children to self-control to the habit of holding passion and prejudice and evil tendencies to an upright and reasoning will. And you have done much to abolish misery from their future lives and, and crimes to society. Daniel Webster. Very profound. So in ending our study with David, not completely, but going back to David in 2 Samuel, let's revisit our text this morning, which was in 1 through 5. What do we know about David at this point before we get into the last two verses? Well, we know he should have been at war with this army leading his men. We know that he saw a beautiful woman bathing and lusted for her in his heart. He found out that she was married to one of his loyal soldiers. So what does David do? After knowing all of this, this is the call that King David makes, the leader, the representative of the nation a man after God's own heart. He says this, verse 4, Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. He had sex with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity. She was past her time of the month. And she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, so she sent and told David, I am with child. takes two to tangle here. If we read the verses closely, she could have refused, even if he was the king. And that's not to excuse either one. And how telling it is to see that David was not satisfied with the wives he already had, multiple wives. He still wanted Bathsheba. Still. Why? Because we can never satisfy the appetite of our flesh. It always wants more. And from a biblical perspective, self-control really is Christ's control. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. We need His help, right? We can't do things on our own. And the more we give ourselves to God, the more strength we have control over the parts that need to be controlled. I have one last story I want to tell you guys about self-control. And I see my brother Johnny Hill here today. 
Your name is in this, brother, but don't be offended. <laughs> this story was told to me by my father who was here today. I was, I was sitting at his bedside as he was recovering. It's a great story, so I had to include it in this message. Thank you for sharing this with me, Dad. There was a 10-year-old boy named Johnny sitting under an apple tree, thinking about life and his future. The devil saw him under the tree and asked him, what are you doing? And what are you thinking about, Johnny? Oh, I'm just wondering about my future and what great things life may have ahead of me. I sure would like to know what my future holds, maybe when I'm 20, said Johnny. Then the devil said, oh, Johnny, you don't have to wait 10 years to know about your future. All you have to do is turn the hands of this clock forward to find out. So Johnny, now 20 years old, is in college driving his brand new car and seriously dating a young woman he has fallen in love with. And Johnny begins to wonder what life would be like at 35. Surely life had much better things to offer him, he thought. And he said, I sure would like to know what my future holds, maybe when I'm 35. And the devil said, sure, Johnny. You don't have to wait 15 years to find out. All you have to do is turn the hands of this clock forward. So now 35, Johnny is married with children living in his new dream home and with a great and prosperous career. And in his head, he begins to wonder if life has anything better. And he says to the devil, I sure would like to know what my future holds. Maybe when I'm 65. Then the devil says, oh yes, Johnny. There are much greater things ahead of you in your future. All you have to do is turn the hands of this clock forward to find out. So Johnny, now 65, is retired as a proud grandparent, enjoying his golden years, watching his children's children grow up. And Johnny says to himself, life has been such a blessing. I couldn't have asked for anything more. The devil leaning in says, oh, Johnny, there is so much more and the best is yet to come. If you want to experience life's best, you don't have to wait. All you have to do is turn the hands of this clock forward to find out. So Johnny turns the hands of the clock forward one last time. And in waking up the next morning, he catches a glimpse of his 95-year-old face in the mirror. And he realizes that his life has blown by and it's coming to an end soon. And in frustration and in anger and in fear, he turns to the devil and yells, you did this to me. With a smirk on his face, the devil quietly said, oh no, Johnny. All I did is give you exactly what you wanted. And the premise of this story, guys, is found in Galatians 6, 7, where it says this, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Are we doing things our way this morning? Are we getting exactly what we want? Are we living our lives in accordance to what the Bible says? One last quote as we close here. Many of you know him, Max Licato, and he said this, I am a spiritual being. After this body is dead, my spirit will soar. I refuse to let what will rot rule my eternity. I choose self-control. I will be drunk only by joy. I will be impassioned only by my faith. I will be influenced only by God. And I will be taught only by Christ. Now this morning, I want to give an invitation for anybody who may be struggling with anything, if you would need prayer, we can pray together. But I never want to miss an opportunity to give anyone a chance to make a big life today.
saying yes to Christ. So if you're here today and this message has spoken to you, whether it's for salvation or prayer, I'll be up here in the front. And if I could have any elders that are here, I see Mike. Maybe there's somebody else. Maybe you guys can be at the sides to also pray for anyone who needs prayer. And if we can have the worship team come up here and play, we'll get into a time of prayer. God bless you guys.